I'm Dr. Ruth Shapiro, <laughs> co-founder and chief executive of the Center for Asian Philanthropy and Society, or as we prefer to be called, CAPS. Um, it is my pleasure to be here today. I really want to thank our co-host, the Edon Prize Foundation, for allowing us to work together on this important conference. And now I'd like to be able to introduce our chairman, Mr. Ronnie Chan. Ronnie is the chairman of Hung Lung Group and Hung Lung Properties, listed companies in Hong Kong working uh, in real estate, um, investment, and management. He also co-founded Morningside Investment Group, which invests in numerous businesses around the world, and has sat on the boards of leading multinational companies in Asia, Europe, and the United States. Ronnie has founded and chaired numerous nonprofit organizations in his life, um, but for today's conference, he's wearing his CAPS hat, or you might say his CAPS cap, um, he, be, as he is the co founder and chairman of the Center for Asian Philanthropy and Society. Ronnie is particularly su well suited to be our chair as, he, as his deep commitment to philanthropy and learning is well known and well-practiced throughout his life. So let me thank Ronnie for being here and turn the camera over to him. Thank you, Ruth. Let me first say a word about Idan Chan. The first time I met him, he traveled with me to the Middle East. And the first question he asked me was about how do I do philanthropy? Well, Charles, let me tell you something. You are wealthy, but you're not the only one. You're generous, but you're not the only one. You're a philanthropist, you're not the only one. But I must say that there are few people who does philanthropy as thoughtful and as dedicated with a heart and not just with the money as our good friend, Mr. Charles Chen. As an ethnic Chinese, I'm very proud to call you my friend because what you do will no doubt benefit hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of Chinese, but also what you are doing will benefit the whole world. As co-chair and as chair and co-founder of CAPS, I'm very happy to participate in this event. CAPS is uh, perhaps one of the very, very few organizations in Asia that specialize in doing hard research on the philanthropic space in this part of the world. We define issues, we collect primary data, we analyze them, and we make proposals in order to enlarge the quantity as well as quality of philanthropy in Asia. Today, we're talking about education, a, a topic that is close to many of our hearts as well as to that of CAPS. As we all know, Asia's future must be in education. So whereas UBS says that, according to the study, one third of the world's foundations are involved one way or another in education. In China, for example, here in Asia, 41% of all the foundations engaged in educational efforts. According to China Charity Alliance, approximately 30% of all the philanthropic dollars in China, which is huge, goes to education. According to CAPS, our own research, we have some more important ones, but here is an interesting one. Nine out of 10 of, the, of China's wealthiest men or women, they participate in education. That's all good. However, COVID-19 COVID has changed a lot of things. People say that COVID-19, people are most concerned for health, understandably so. Other people are more concerned about the, uh, about the economy or the environment, true indeed. But there's one thing that perhaps the world has yet to pay sufficient attention to, and that is the impact of COVID-19 on education. Perhaps the effect may be more far reaching than its effect on health and the economy. Listen to this. 
according to Save the Children, a wonderful organization whose head is a friend of mine. The Save Children says, for the first time in human history, an entire generation has their education disrupted. As we all know, the first five to seven years of a child's life is the most important. It really determines, to a good extent, the rest of their life. UNICEF tell us that. Harvard University tell us that. Even Aristotle said that. Aristotle says, give me a child until he is seven, and I, I will show you the man. UNESCO says, tells us that 191 countries today on Earth, that's out of a total of what, 200 some? 191 of them no longer have classes. How many students are involved? One and a half billion people, students. Of that, they estimated that half a billion, 500 million of them, in particular in the lower income countries, are today not learning at all. 91 to 94% of all the students are out of school. And in the lower, level, lower income level countries, that number is 99%. According to World Bank, again, I quote, listen, 25% or more of students may, may fall below the baseline level of proficiency needed to participate effectively and productively in society as a result of school closure alone. Let me give an anecdote. I have a wonderful driver in Hong Kong. He has a five-year-old and a nine-year-old daughter. And recently, because of COVID, he had to quarantine himself twice. Unfortunately, he's okay now for 28 days. So I asked him, I said, what do you do for 28 days at home? He said, well, I have to help my daughters with their studies. Do you think that a five-year-old and a nine-year-old left alone if both parents work, will be studied in front of a computer or Zoom? I can hardly believe it. Another colleague of mine, well-educated and his wife as well, they have a three-year-old and an eight-year-old daughter. And he tells me he's worried about the physical development, the social development, as well as the intellectual development of their two daughters. Consider the fact that the budget has been cut for it for education has been cut greatly. Again, I refer you to a study by the Saving Children. It says that there is now a gap of 77 billion US dollars short in education. Well, Charles, even if you give all your money away, you will not be able to bridge that gap. Again, according to Save the Children, 10 million children because of COVID-19, may be out of school forever. This is just the beginning. And if COVID were to continue, there'll be more than 10 million students forever out of school. Consider the secondary effects that all that is having, having in the world today. As we all know, for a long time, wealth differential in many countries have been enlarging. And as we all know also, COVID-19 hits the lower income country more than the others. So the di differential in wealth between the high income countries and the low income countries will only enlarge. And not only among countries, between countries, even within a community, the differential in human development of the wealthy and the less so will be great. Many of us here are philanthropists. My family also engaged in education for the last 50 years. A lot of us, all of us together, have been trying to improve the ed educational standard and coverage of the world. Think about this. COVID-19 alone has pushed all of us back, push the world back in terms of education. 
So if education ever is important, and it always is, today is the day. The post-COVID world will be a different world. And hence the topic for this discussion today, what will education look like in a post-pandemic world? As the chair of CAPS, I'm very pleased to see so many very, very wonderful speakers joining us today. And in particular, it is my great honor and pleasure to now introduce to you an amazing, shall I say, young man in the ripe old age of 36. He is the Minister of Education and Culture of the Republic of Indonesia. As we all know, Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world in terms of population. And in ASEAN, it accounts for something like 40% of the population as well as the GDP. So it is a very, very important country. And why does such a country have a 36-year-old Minister of Education and Culture? There must be a good reason. Nadim is one of those amazing individuals. If you were to tell me, who are the people that will change the world to the better in the coming days and years? I would say it would be people like Nadim Makaram and maybe including and probably include, including Nadim Makaram. After university at Brown University in the United States, he went on to get an MBA from Harvard Business School. He joined McKinsey, one of the best consulting firms in the world. And then he founded several companies. He founded Solora, he's founded Katuku, which is a payment service provider. And then in 2010, he founded a company that now everybody knows. It's called Gojack. But what I didn't know yesterday was a new word that Dr. Ru Shapiro, my co-founder at CAPS, taught me. He said, Gojack is now a deca decacorn. I know what is a unicorn. to become the Minister of Education and Culture for his country. We, have, we at CAPS have spoken to several of his key staff and they all are very impress in the, in the impressive individuals. Why did they give up high paid jobs? Because they believe in Nadim. They believe that Nadim will be able to do so many good for his country, for the educational system, and for all the young people in this fourth largest population country in the world. In conversation with him will be my partner and my co-founder uh, of CAPS, Dr. Ru Shapiro. She hailed from the United States, went to Stanford. She's one of those few who turned down Harvard and went to Stanford and got a speech to that. So Ruth will, be, will engage in a, a conversation with Nadim. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome Nadim Makaram, and Dr. Ruth Shapiro, with that, I turn over to Ruth. Ruth is yours.